Hello everyone and welcome to Stronghold with me the Sprite. Me the Doctor. And I, the Bard. Today we're going to be fighting the end of the pig after Smoky Bacon. Well, we're going decided. to be fighting the pig, not the end of the pig. I think this one is literally just a siege against the pig's castle, so I might have to, there might have to be some focus time for the Doctor on this one. Well, don't worry, I've got plenty to talk about. Apparently you've got a rant right off the bat, Sprite. I mean, like, I think I left off the... It's been a couple of months for us viewership, but I think I left off the last recording where I was going to speak about Greek fire and how that's basically wildfire from Game of Thrones and all that good fun stuff. But you've got a rant you want to just plow right ahead with, Sprite. So, I discovered something recently. For any viewers who aren't aware, the Bard and the Doctor think that Faramir is some kind of, like, booby prize right, of before, the Lord before... of the Rings... Before you Characters. do anything, we're just going to have a little look at what we're dealing with here. Oh, it's this castle again. The one we lay siege to and ran through last time. I've got a gigantic force here, Oh my so. days. Yeah. Jesus. Which is getting cut to ribbons already, Doctor. Yeah, i got to think and plan. But I've got siege towers as well. Uh, so that's something you can talk oh, about. Oh, I love a siege tower. But Run away, little chicken. I'm going to clip your wings. <laughs> the first thing we need to do is just get that moat filled in. and I'm the, the discussion is whether to lose my spearman filling it in or my mace moon can also fill it in and they are more durable but there's a question about whether we want to actually save on to them for storming the keep which i'm pretty sure i do oh shit they're sending out mace moon that could be good though you could deplete their forces yeah get them boys just die in a hail of crossbow bolts surely you want to surely you want to get those mace men in there no, Siege Tower, come back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think he is actually producing Drive me, drive me closer, boys, so I can yeah. run over their toes. <laughs> <laughs> ah, here come, here come the big lads. So Siege Towers vote work in this work very much like, um, like Ladderman, uh, but they're just, they're slow, but they are more durable. If you get a Siege Tower up to the walls, it provides a way in which you can get in. And you can just send an unlimited amount of units up the walls until they go up, unless the enemy destroys it. So they're basically just a much more, a slower moving, but more durable ladderman. Do you want to know a fun fact about Siege, well, many fun facts about Siege Towers, Doctor? Or do you want to get the Sprite's Faramir discussion out of the way first? We'll get that. I'm just going to let you know what I'm doing. Well, I'm initially going to try and fill in this section of the moat. It worked well for me last time. I think there's just too much defense there, and we risk breaking through into a killing hole. Which, yes. amongst other things, has caged war dogs there. What?! So uh, I'm going to try and go in this way, and then the plan will be to bust through here, and then we're straight into the business part of it. I am expecting this to, to, to not succeed with this, but I am going to attempt to dig in the moat, and I imagine we'll probably just lose a lot of spearmen in this act, um, and I may just have to restart, but we're prepared for that. Hey, we're, I'm we're not bringing anyone to do any kind of covering file. Fire. Oh, oh, oh no. Oh, my... Well, well, we now, learned quickly. Well, now we you're, know that's, we know that's there. Good oh, gracious. they've got killing pits as well. Right, okay. Oh! Dog okay. humanity! He has... He has done things since we last attacked this fortress. <laughs> he's, he's upgraded. He's clearly <laughs> learned. Cool. Well, what matters is we've triggered them. <laughs> Great. Those men did not die in vain. Guys, why are you going that way? This way. Oh, the horrid, horrid, burning fire. Awful. Right, have a conversation about siege towers or Faramir or wildfire I'll, or anything you wish. I'll go first. So, Faramir. The Doctor and the Bard basically look down on him as inferior to Aragorn. I absolutely reject this viewpoint because Faramir grew up in, quite frankly, unfavorable ways and he still becomes a better person for it, whereas Aragorn spent, you know, fucking 70 or 80 years ignoring his destiny, ignoring what he had to do, and running away from what he should have been doing when he could have been improving the lives of people, yada yada yada. So, I discovered something recently that rather amused me. Tolkien viewed himself as Faramir, and his own wife as Eowyn. Yeah. Good, good knowledge. And specifically, his Faramir's view on war and all that sort of thing comes from an informed understanding of actual war and uh, Faramir's line where he's like, uh, "I do not do love, not love the, the soldier yeah. for his bravery." Or exactly, the sword, the sword for sharpness. sharpness. I only love. Yeah, that that is basically Tolkien's own view. To be fair, Faramir gets a lot of really poetic lines in Lord of the Rings. That's yeah. because Faramir is fucking excellent. Don't spread them out, Doctor. Go in one. No, I'm, I'm triggering the Greek fire. 
Uh, slash I, killing bits. I didn't actually know that, Sprite, and that's actually pretty cool. And like, I like, genuinely, I like Vanavir. I, I do think he's a kind of poor man's Aragorn, which is where we differ, but like, that's cool, I didn't know that. So, nah. And unlike some authors looking at you, Stephen King, he didn't write himself as the main protagonist, but he did write himself as a core and important person. But also, it's worth noting in the book, Faramir is a lot more one-dimensional than in the film. In the book, he's basically just always pure and good. Like, he isn't tempted by the ring or to take Frodo. He, like, he doesn't have this conflict. Like, he has his father's a dick kind of thing, but he basically has no... He, at the fil in the book, starts where he ends in the film. Like, yeah. he doesn't come to that realisation, really. He's basically just always like that. I've, Making me even more. I've just started re... Not, I was going to say rereading, but I'm listening to... Oh, you listen to the circus ones, yeah. Yeah, the Andy circus recordings. They're dynamite, by the way, viewership. If you have Spotify... If you pay for your Spotify, you can get a certain number of hours per week listening to audiobooks. And the and, and the Andy Circus recordings of Lord of the Rings are now all on Spotify, so I thoroughly recommend them. And if this conversation is interesting to you, go back and watch the many, many series the Doctor and I have done on the Lord of the Rings. We do Lego Lord of the Rings. We did... What else we do? We did, we did several uh, Shadow of Mordor. shows. Oh, Shadow of Mordor, of course. That's a really good show. We read, like, three books to research that. No, we... Well, you I did. Holy shit. Because <laughs> I'm, I'm a professional. I'm like the doctor. <laughs> <laughs> uh. yeah, go go watch those series if you enjoy Lord of the Rings viewership. But that's very cool, Spirit. Where did you come across this information? From I me. I can't remember. It was me. I found it. And I told you, and you were like, yeah, I'm going to say this next time I'm recording. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm actually even prouder of you that like you made a mental note of it to, <laughs> to show me up. Yes. <laughs> Gonna go run right into that Greek fire, are you, Doctor? I think they won't trigger it unless there's enough spearmen. I think this side attack isn't gonna work. I think they've got this massive fire ditch, and their killing field oh. seems to be regenerating. So, yeah, I think we can't do it this way. My. Why are they running into the fire? Because they can't. Right, this game's from 2003. AI wasn't as good back then. They just go in a direction <laughs> towards the thing that you've told them to go in a direction towards. I Gee, the fact that I've, I've, seen rings... three, I've seen 300 of my fellows burned alive. Maybe I'm fireproof. Yes. Yeah. Um, Lord of the Rings, Two Towers, actually invented a bunch of AI for game characters. Yeah, like they, game yeah, sprites. Massive. So that they would... Um, interact naturally. Interact naturally another, yeah. and actually have a unique decision-based thing on what they would do. Yeah, it's basically... It was and a, it was used in a bunch of games. It was, an early, yeah, it was an early form of agent-based algorithm where basically every every actor just has to react to its immediate surroundings and as such you get then the emergent behaviour of crowds uh, coming out really naturally. That's Which very is cool. fucking awesome. So yeah, I'm, I'm done with Lord of the Rings now. You can, you can talk about your uh, Siege Towers. Or Greek while fire. the Doctor works. burns to death. Let's start with the Greek Fire, because uh, that feels very pertinent. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we, we ain't at Siege Towers yet, so yeah. <laughs> I think I got, like, just started the explanation in the last recording viewership, but effectively Greek Fire was a compound that was made by the Byzantine Empire, so the Eastern Roman Empire, otherwise known as the Byzantine Empire. It's interesting to note that, like, the people in the Eastern Roman Empire never called themselves Byzantines. They just call themselves the Roman Empire. Yeah, as far as they were, yeah. as far as they were concerned, they were just Romans. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, like, they would refer to themselves as the last Romans or the Eastern Romans or just yeah. the Romans, as far as they were concerned. But effectively, a bunch of kind of vaguely Greek people that have inherited the Roman Empire in the eastern half of what was the old Roman Empire. They did this compound called Greek Fire, which to this day we still chemically aren't entirely certain what was in this stuff. Certainly a mix of like different oils and like sawdust, and effectively it's like a medieval napalm is what they eventually create. And it's so de deadly that it becomes like a closely guarded secret of the Byzantine Empire. So there's a manuscript that we have where the, I think it's maybe Emperor Alexis or one of the emperors Alexis. There's one of his memoirs or like documents where he's directly quoted as saying that anybody who gives away the secret of creating Greek fire should be considered an utmost traitor to the state. You know, they should it's a capital crime. You should be executed, hung, drawn and quartered, all sorts of horrible things. It would be the same as you. if you were like, you know, involved in like smuggling like uranium fuel or something nowadays, or like providing secrets on like how nuclear powers are enriching uranium for weaponry and stuff like yeah. that. Yeah. One of the, the we still don't, I don't understand the chemical composition. In fact, no one has got a good handle on it. But the really cool, not cool, horrifying, I suppose, thing about wildfire is that you can't quench it with water. 
Like, it's not Napalm's kind of the same. It's basically you just need something that kind of burns chemically and then some kind of jelly that it's dispersed in. That's basically, that's the kind of core concept of Napalm. And yeah, as, I'm, as I understand it, I think we know it's something like that. We just don't know what it is. And I think we know it's not the same as Napalm that we developed in, you know, the 40s. Yeah, there's a, a really famous account. Like, I assume that if you're watching this, you you know, you're old enough. You've watched Game of Thrones. The Battle of the the Blackwater, where Stannis sails his ship into King's Landing and then sets everything on fire with wildfire. That historically happened during an attack on Constantinople, which is the capital of the Byzantine Empire, by the Kievan Rus. Effectively, like, sort of Russian Vikings of the Kievan yeah. Rus. Although their precise ethnic makeup is fiercely debated. Not least of all because modern Russia doesn't like to acknowledge... Oh my days, that's even more wildfire. Cool, they've got some there. That's worth knowing. I think a it's safe to say they've wildfire everywhere. Yes, but they've been running their troops through this middle bit here, so at least I know it's got no killing pits in it, which is crucial. I think this is just going to be a, lot, a case of a lot of attempts at this, and we'll just, like, restart each time, really. That's, that's what the complex sieges in this game end up kind of being like, so... Do you think it's a trial by com a trial sorry, a trial by fire, Doctor? There we go. Or, that would have been trial great if you error. actually nailed it, yeah. <laughs> oh, I messed up like hang on, the magic of editing I'm sure could fix it. <laughs> uh, it's down to the sprite. Oh no, the, the sprite doesn't fix those things. Oh, okay. No, all the sprite does is fix things where she got something wrong and is like, well, I want to put a note in here saying what I meant to say, and it's like, no, fuck That you. is not true. You always ask to do that, and I No, I don't. Mm. Anyway, there is a strong historical precedent for the existence of fire traps like the ones in this game. Just definitely not in continental Europe. No. Not in continental Europe in 1270. No, definitely not. Although, that being said, so Harold... Oh, Hagada? Get it. Harold, Harold Har Hardrada. Hagada is Harold, an airport in Egypt. Harold Hardrada, like, one of his many titles. We spoke about him earlier yeah. in this series of your ship. He's one of the claimants to the throne of England in 1066, but... One of his many titles is the Burner of Bulgars, as oh. in Bulgarians. And the reason for this is that earlier, or kind of midway through his career as a mercenary in service of the Byzantine Empire, he fought against the Bulgarian kingdom. And, like, they had actual flamethrowers, or it's implied yeah. strongly. And we don't know what these things are, whether they were, like, tanks that the, the Byzantines were able to, like, pressurize and then somehow spray wildfire from these, like, super soakers, basically, <laughs> and, and, and ignite it. But certainly, they, they seem to have had flamethrower-style weapons built around Greek fire that we know people like Harold Hardrada were using in 1066. Which so is horrifying, yeah. It, it's crazy! Like, how what advanced form of warfare for, like, thousand, or, or almost a thousand years ago? Absolutely wild. Almost as wild as the fire. Yeah. Right, Don't we've got a tower yes, up. We've got a tower up. This changes everything. This is chaos. Oh, yeah. Get him, boys. Straight in the pooper. Bizarrely, the way that, like, this game is using siege towers is not really how siege towers were used historically. Go on. So it's actually very difficult to get something that large and cumbersome and ponderous... In position. position. Yeah, positioned against the walls without it being smashed or, like, cut down or set on fire. What you would typically do is when you would erect a siege tower, get it close enough to the walls that the people on the tower could fire missiles over the parapet ah. to like to kill the besieger or to kill the defenders. That makes sense. It's, at least in the accounts that I've read, certainly of the Crusades, which are... I mean, the first Crusade, I think, is in 11... Or 1095 is the first Crusade. Yeah. And they, they certainly have siege engines, which they roll up to the walls and then... They throw things over or yeah. it allows them to get above the, the protection of the walls to fire arrows and crossbows at the people defending the wall. But this notion of like, you remember this, the beautiful scene in Return of the King where the siege tower makes it up to the wall and then a, a million Urukai come running out of it. <laughs> yeah. Apparently, that, to, to my knowledge, that doesn't really happen. It's just not how they use siege towers. Yeah. Doctor, Which is why unfor did you pull back? Uh, because they can't hit, they can, were shooting me over the walls there, but they weren't shooting the ram. So, I can't get up on the walls all the way around. I okay. have to get through the second level, so I want at least the ram to be able to take out that first bit. And then now we can attack in the second bit more safely. I can get the second tower up. Possibly I can get the ram up, but I think the ram is probably not going to survive that, because now they can. They've realised they can shoot on it. Weirdly, that gate does a lot to block line of sight. We have regret... Are they catapults somewhere? Uh, it looks like they... Yeah, they've got a mangonel up there. And another one there. Dreadful. Did we talk about mangonels? I don't believe so. We'll be seeing a lot of them, so... Yeah, I mean, I don't know a great deal about them. They're effectively a smaller catapult that's 
kind of like the anti-infantry version of a catapult. That it's meant to like drop a stone that shatters and creates loads of shrapnel, and ideally you use it against either massed infantry the way they're using it, or you use it to try and not bring down a castle wall, but drop it on top of a castle wall to demoralize, scatter, kill the defenders, basically. Yeah. It's like a baby catapult is what it boils down to. Or at least in my understanding. I, I'm by no means an expert of viewership. I'm just someone who reads books. <laughs> That's what you do. You read and you know things. I I do read and I know things. Well, I read. I don't know why I know things. Here we go. Now the question That'd is, be- how, how much can this tower go before it gets shot down? And it's the thing about, obviously, I kind of want my other guys around to basically be better targets. Wait, wait, is the first tower destroyed? No, it's there, but it's deployed. We can't do anything with it now. Oh, so you can only use them once? Yeah. Once they've been oh. deployed, they you're, you're stuck. But this one looks like it should make it up all right. I was reading just this week about ancient Greek siege in No, like, fuck. Oh. Right, we're boned now. Ladderman. Right, the ladderman. Oh, there. fire. Oh! Yes, I thought they might have some bullshit inside this courtyard. Man! Yeah. That's, uh... That's not good. It's a hard siege. Good lord. So, oh, the, I need to hold the, some spearmen burn, back to make sure we... Ani- the burning animations are it's awful. horrible. It's awful, yeah. So, let's try that again. Good gracious. It always starts with these guys being shot, which is pretty annoying. That's got to be an error, yeah, right? Yeah, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, boss. Is there, is there a way on the opposite side of the fortress? Like, to the the east no, of the I fortress? No, I suspect that will be exactly the same problem. Uh, okay. Oh, the pig pops up. Yeah, he always does. No, this is just going to be slow and difficult, basically. And grueling. Yeah. I guess I like how siege warfare yeah. was. <laughs> it's basically just all about getting that first mo- bit of moat dug and getting be able to get a thing through. It does make the very effective point that like you would never take this by storm. Yeah. Like not just you would never try to. It's like you could try, but you would never manage. Yeah, like to take filling this in the moat is, is is relatively like I'm complaining about it, but it's easy on this compared to what filling in a moat would be like in real life. Like oh yeah, that's annoying with a modern JCB, <laughs> basically. Even with a modern JCB, I'm not sure a JCB would necessarily protect you from like crossbows. Yeah. <laughs> Although surely the, the glass on a JCB must be like bulletproof. Bulletproof? Do you think people are trying yeah. to shoot you while you're. <laughs> no, it's just. Well, in case something falls in the glass. Yeah, right? I think oh, it's solid. I don't think. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I watched a, a bizarrely scientific video about what would happen if a single Abrams mainline battle tank from the modern US military was <laughs> was to be deployed at the Battle of Waterloo. <laughs> <laughs> and apparently they, they worked out pretty quickly that like <laughs> so the Abrams has only got fuel for like three or four hours and it can only carry enough ammunition to fire like, I don't know, fifty times. So like in the fifty times it could fire it would kill a whole bunch of, you know, British people or French people depending on what the site it was deployed on. But like the main way that the Abrams would get shit done is it would just run people over. <laughs> <laughs> like, like there's there's nothing in Napoleon's arsenal that can touch it. Like even his mainline cannons can like barely dent yeah. the armor. And that, that's assuming that he can get a direct hit, which given the speed of the Abrams tank and the velocity of a cannonball isn't even guaranteed. Yeah. So like, <laughs> apparently that's like, hilarious. <laughs> just that Abrams tank driving backwards and forwards over the fields of Belgium. Uh, tank shock, the old maneuver. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> took me a while to, to figure out when you were talking about the Abrams, you weren't talking about the director. Yeah. Yeah, it's just no. fucking J.J. Abrams running around in Waterloo trying to slit Napoleon single-handedly. That's kind of yeah. what I was thinking, and I was like, are they particularly good at fight sequences, or am I missing something? Yeah, his secret weapon well, is I- lens flare. <laughs> <laughs> I quite like J.J. Abrams, but that's accurate. <laughs> Bizarrely, like, the, the Abrams battle tank, the, I think it's the mainstay of the American military at the moment, it's their primary armoured fighting vehicle. The... It's named after General Crichton Abrams. Yeah. So, yeah, which, I mean, obviously we're aware of the connection, so you don't need to bleep the, the thing, but yeah. So there you go. He was a, a, ma- a major U.S. general. I think he was the supreme U.S. commander during the Vietnam War. Or and then he wrote the latter part, part of it. 
No, I did a different one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think the, the I think don't quote me on this, but I think the Abrams battle tank is named after him. Hmm. All right, we lost a lot there. Yeah. Nope, nope, you go. Mm -hmm. Oh, damn it, I thought, I, oh, I thought we worked so through close. not. Because there's a tiny little pixel of Earth left. Fucking towers. I think you need a lot of people up there to actually get through. I think that's the only, that's what I'm learning from this, is like the only way to really break through is to have... Do you want to try, do you want to try just a full-on frontal assault? I, think I basically need to by the sounds of it, but the issue is... I need to work out what's the minimum number of units that I need to trigger the uh, napalm. Because we can't do anything yeah. while the napalm's a threat. I find the pig particularly repulsive. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't help that that's the point. Yeah. Every time I have to wait for this trickle of macemen who do nothing. Oh, they run into your crossbow is real good. Yeah. <laughs> if only he then started sending out more of his units. That would be nice. Is the pig inside the castle? Yes. So, like, they're, they're there bored. There he is. That's that him. He doesn't look very poor sight. No, he's because uh, it's exactly the same model as our lord, but in red rather than yeah. blue. They're all the same. <laughs> You trying to say that the ruling classes are all the same pigs? Very good. <laughs> yes. Please, please save your good <laughs> that, banter for camera. Sorry. Got, are those gallows in oh, there? Oh yeah, yeah. He's got bad things. That's why his enemy have got like negative five to all their attacks and stuff like that. But that doesn't seem to make much of a difference. Get him, boys! Up, up, and up she goes. Will she stop? Nobody knows. A lot of this force I want to bring back and not actually have it even go in there. Because you don't need a lot. Turns out you do not need a lot of mace men to like overwhelm the de the defenders in here. Yeah, I I was learning a lot about crossbows. I've got a lot to say about crossbows, but uh, the way to a not on a siege mission, I think. Yeah, to, yeah, to okay. do any any cool lore dumping. It turns out there's a lot more to crossbow warfare than I thought, but we'll, we'll wait and talk about that later. <laughs> the coward's longbow, some call it. Ah, uh, I'm off. I've challenged that notion, actually. You know what? We're doing some interesting new stuff. Have to have this conversation now. Why not? Sure. Um, <laughs> this might be montage for your benefit, viewership. But uh, <laughs> the doctor's tried numerous attempts to get through this fortress. This this attempt's going better yeah. than previously. Turns out rushing so. at the beginning is important for just clearing the. Like, to have been able to dig. You can't dig in waves, whereas I think I might be able to do the rest of this in waves a little bit. Yeah. The question is about whether I can get the ram out to safety in time. Which is kind of. Well, in between this episode and the previous one, I, I did a bunch of reading oh, and fuck. Kind of watching I'm videos. Fine. Yeah, oh, I Jesus. didn't realize the manganel was firing, but that's fine. To be honest, we don't need the ram so much as we need the tower in the next thing. Fuck me, he's got quite the range, though. Shit. Oh. Yeah. So my plan here is to send in at least some spearmen to trigger stuff in here, then send in a fair chunk of macemen to go with them, and basically just have them kind of chip at the walls, which should provide a decent bit of cover. Then I'm going to bring the tower in and deploy the tower, then the ram in and deploy the ram. And yes, everything's going to basically be cut down, but I'm kind of, I want everyone to basically move in in a kind of like steady line that will support the tower rather than being like, uh, right. That's, oh, yep. he's used the fire, has, which is what you cool. want. This is the point of deploying everyone basically in a, in a line. Is it really maximizes the chances of the tower getting through, which is what really matters there. And it looks like we're through Where'd with the go? tower. Woo! We're through with the tower. Up we go, up we go. Right. Excellent. Now, Once you get through this level, that's good. Yeah. Because now it's basically just about get, making sure I get a decent contingent of macemen to everywhere that they are needed. Destroy those mangonels. 
Even the pig knows when he's yep. fucked. He's roasted. I smell bacon. Jesus Christ, Bart. Gam, Doctor. We're doing all right here. Not amazing, but not terrible either. Have you got any of your missile troops left? Do I don't know. I'll have to think about it. Because you could put them in one of the occupied towers and just yeah. shoot. Unfortunately, I think I just lost too many in that assault. Oh my god, he's setting fire to his oh own Oh yeah, bridge. he'll do oh that. Yeah. The rich will burn us down in order to protect themselves. Vive la resistance, Sprite. <laughs> Shit. I was looking to find the troops I have left, and this this is it. Oh dear. Yeah, we lost too many. Okay. But, really good start. Hmm, yes. I think this is going to think, yeah, where we're either going to very quickly overwhelm him, or we're just fucked. Unfortunately, like, we can't starve him out for the fact that everything's on fire. That doesn't meaningfully do anything. Can't can no. you? Because it doesn't matter whether he's unpopular. He just still has the units that he has. And he's got too many for us to... Can't right. the... Does the fire not spread to his buildings? Uh, and only the buildings. It won't destroy the keep. All of this stuff will eventually destroy, but it doesn't mean anything. And he still has people, but you don't. Yeah. I, just think I have got 15 macemen, which is not enough. I can try and fuck up some stuff with tunnelers. That'll be fun. Uh, you've, got, you've got tunnelers this two whole time. Right, tunnelers are just not great. You've got two tunnelers. My days. The devastation. Yeah, let's build a tunnel. Yes. He's just got... It's that whole squad of pikemen back yeah. here. My only hope is to get enough macemen through to take out the Lord. But I'm not going to be able to do it with like 15. No chance. Just how resilient is the Lord relative to... Uh, more than 15 macemen, I'll give you that. Yeah, okay. Well, it's just, oh, what a valiant yeah. effort from that guy. <laughs> so this is what we got left. He really... Yeah. It's not oh, great. Dear. Uh, also, it was a here's a really effort, funny thing with Ladderman, really... which I've not pointed out yet. Their, their voice is like really cowardly if you listen to them. Yes, your majesty. I think we're ready. I'll be going home. Okay, sir. If you disband <laughs> them, they then suddenly go... Thank you, my lord, and get a, a badass sounding deep voice. Need some muscle. Fuck it. George. The advantage of Maceman is they are quick. Yeah! Okay. Charge! It's a charge, guys. Oh. Yes, all that way, you fucking prick. And most of them are on pretty low health. I don't think they're gonna make this, but hey. No. They're running now, though. That's the advantage of Maceman. When they run, they're fast. But I think they're just gonna get the shit kicked out of them. Yeah. It's a lot of arrows. Yeah, we've lost four already. Oh, those two, those pike will go through them like a hot knife through butter, yeah, won't they? Yeah, basically. Oh dear. Do you have any no. pike, man? This is frustrating. This level of how little it gives me. I think it might be worth holding back some of my range stuff at this point. Yeah. Because I think sending in the range stuff when I send in that big swarm at the beginning does very little. To overthrow the people.